today on Missing Link. What is it connects fish with classical music? How come the classics fit alongside data storage? Where's the connection between data storage and preserving jars? And what do tin cans have to do with the polar expedition? There aren't any links? Oh yes there are, you just have to look really hard. Missing Link New York. Over 8 million people live in this bustling megacity, and they consume vast amounts of food. The Bronx fish market is the second largest in the world. The fish and seafood sold here come from all over the world and supply the whole metropolitan area. The freshest fish on the continent. Biologist Martin Schreibmann knows that this is just marketing hype. The fish traded here has come a very long way, from Asia, Northern Europe or the Caribbean. Fish caught domestically has become a rarity, and only a fraction of the goods are caught in the wild. Much of the produce comes from breeding farms on the other side of the world and has been deep frozen during weeks of transport. But Schreibmann is optimistic that things can be done differently. Most of the product here is imported, very little from the States. And it doesn't make any sense. We subsidize foreign countries, we train them, and then we buy their products back. It makes no sense. We should be doing that sort of business here. Developing economic development, job training, creating jobs, and, and doing it rather than importing from faraway countries, produce materials, products that are consumed locally. At Brooklyn College, Schreibmann is working on an alternative a project he calls City Fish. He farms tilapia, a type of cichlid which is increasingly found on menus in Europe too. The captive fish are fed algae pellets, but in the wild they're omnivorous. Feeding fish a vegetarian diet is one of the biggest challenges that aquaculture farms face all over the world. To date, they've only had success with a few species. The dirty water in the fish tank is filtered and reused. The recirculation system provides a constant supply of clean water. Almost every day, Martin Schreibmann checks the health of the fish. And they are positively thriving. He never has to use the medications which are commonplace in most conventional aqua farms. Schreibmann's fish have not had a single case of parasites or fungus. He is not allowed to sell the fish while the city fish project is still in the research phase, but he eats them himself and gives them to friends. The small scale prototype farm Schreibmann has developed could be possible on a large scale one day and he's even expanded his ecosystem. Medicinal plants and vegetables flourish in the aquarium effluent. Everything from echinacea to cabbages and basil. The plants thrive in the natural fertilizer. And the real bonus is the plants cleanse the water too. It's a perfectly balanced system. The drinking quality water is then pumped back into the fish tank. It's a win-win situation because you are able to grow multiple organisms, at least two, within the same system where you've only grown one before. And the organisms are symbiotic in their relationship so that they, the plants, for example, will help maintain the integrity of the water, the cleanliness of the water. And you also have reduction in the cost of the system because you are generating two marketable products. Schreibmann thinks that aquaculture needs to be shifted from coastal waters to city-based farms, where breeding facilities could be set up in empty buildings. This would create jobs and encourage local fish farming. A feast for the ears. Classical music. Mozart, Beethoven or Haydn are much more than just an acoustic spectacle to many people. But the question is, what do fish have in common with classical music? Music has the capacity to change our mood, 
we can all recognize that from our own experience. And it's a prime objective of musicians. Music touches our heart, reaches our legs, as well as entering our ears. For Greek scientists, though, this realization wasn't enough. They wanted to know, don't ask me why, if fish react to music, or if the latest hit just left them cold. And remarkably, even though a fish can only mime the words of a song, they do have very good hearing. The result of this intriguing scientific experiment on a scale of 1 to 10 put Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart at number 1. The mood shift of fish on hearing Eine kleine Nachtmusik was quite clear and resulted in a healthy appetite, while other fish experienced a change in skin color and their interest in reproduction increased noticeably. So whether fish care about Handel's water music or Schubert's The Trout, the researchers can't verify. But they can tell us that fish aren't hard of herring. Soweto, South Africa's biggest township. In the apartheid era, it symbolized racial segregation and the oppression of the black population. Today, it's an area that's full of contrasts. Boitumelo Chuena has always dreamed of playing with a big orchestra. This economic student from Soweto loves classical music and is a passionate bassoon player. She rehearses every day with a small ensemble called Melody. Right now they're rehearsing pieces from the Magic Flute and the Barber of Seville for the International Mozart Festival in Johannesburg. The sound of classical music is quite unusual here in the township, but Puerto Melo thinks it's pretty cool all the same. Ours, it's not about anything else except how it sounds. If it sounds nice, like a Mozart, if it's, if it's got like a nice funky rhythm or something like that, and it catches your ear. Ensemble director Nimrod Moloto knows that his music project means a lot to these kids from the extremely rough Soweto neighborhoods. The very first steps are on the recorder, of course. Boito Melo teaches the youngest children. Classical music can change your life, she says. Today is the big day for Nimrod's ensemble, a performance at the Johannesburg Mozart Festival. Artistic director Florian Ulig believes it's important that Soweto's young talent is included in the concert program because Mozart's image is being transformed at his international music festival, explains the German pianist. The image we have of Mozart today, which epitomizes a kind of bourgeois elite form of culture, isn't really accurate. And it's really moving when you see the kids' enthusiasm and eagerness to play Mozart, as well as other music, because we do jazz and many other styles too. Boitumelo makes her way home through the streets of the township. Since apartheid ended, there are still many problems in Soweto, including crime, AIDS, poverty and unemployment. But despite the problems, the 20-year-old likes living here. Seven people live in this tiny house, and Boitumelo has managed to pass on her passion for classical music to the whole family. She even gives her sister flute lessons. It took a while for her family to get used to the sound of the bassoon, says Boitomelo. It opened up a new world when she first brought classical music into the house four years ago. Before that, they'd only listened to jazz or township hip-hop. A performance with Dutch tenor Bernard Lunen at the Mozart Festival. It's a real highlight for the young South African musicians. And Lunen is deeply impressed with the young classical players too. To 
interesting music that we have done, you know, that we've known, we've grown up with almost. And to see that, you know, real genius is knows no bounds. And whether it's downtown Salzburg or in the Hofoper in, in, in Wien or here in Soweto, you know, Mozart's music uh, reigns supreme. And it's plain to see that the Mozart Festival in Soweto is a dream come true for Boitumelo and the other kids in the ensemble. The production of electronic data is limitless these days. But where can we store the masses of digital information? Storage methods of the past are out of date. But how is classical music connected to data storage? Never in human history has so much data been produced and so much data been stored. This has resulted in the need for ever more data to be captured. It all really got going with the CD. This was meant originally only for storing music. Initially, the developers couldn't decide how big it should be. OK, compact disc, compact music cassette, we'll make it about 10 centimetres, they said. This gave the CD a playing time of roughly 60 minutes. Legend has it that the then vice president of Sony, Norio Oga, wasn't too pleased about that. As a classical music fan, he wanted to hear his favorite music from the beginning to end without interruption. Beethoven's Ninth in the Furtwängler version lasts for 74 minutes, and that needs a CD to be 12 centimeters. The developers countered with the argument that a CD would then be too big to fit in a suit pocket. Orga San commissioned a study to measure suit pockets around the world. The result? Pockets are big enough, and we now have a 74-minute CD. January 1982. Confidential company data is being stored on a hard disk, among it staff pension information. The management think it's smart to keep up with the latest technology. But now the problems are surfacing. A tightly guarded high security compound. Identity checks and surveillance cameras. The company managers are hoping they'll get help in recovering the data here, 30 years later. This well protected facility contains the contents of countless dead storage devices. In the past, many companies were too hasty in trusting short lived data storage technology. Experts at this company will now try to salvage as much of the data as they can. The newly arrived hard disk, a 1982 vintage, is protected like the crown jewels. It contains sensitive company data. The data recovery experts are sworn to professional secrecy. After all, if the data recovery is successful, they could access confidential personal data or product information. The diagnosis confirms that the hard disk is dead. It's probably the read write head. It could be repaired if spare parts were available, but after so many years, that's highly unlikely. Nonetheless, Sebastian Quint thinks there's still a chance, but it requires conditions comparable to an operating theatre. Just one speck of dust could threaten the sensitive operation and destroy the digital data that's probably still accessible. Uncertain of the outcome, the data recovery expert starts his detective work. First, he has to make the digital information visible again. He transplants the old data platters into an intact housing. This is only possible because the experts have a stock of every type of device, which they guard carefully. Otherwise, they wouldn't have a chance. The data from 1982 has been reanimated in the form of rows of meaningless characters. But the old software that could read it is no longer available. The experts have written countless conversion programs in order to turn old data into a readable form. Have they found the right formula yet? A coherent text suddenly appears on the screen. The customer's in luck, but he'd prefer not to discuss any details of the operation. Blind trust in digital technology with fatal consequences. We've grown dependent on systems that make information instantly available, any place, any time. Fascinating technology with risks that we've ignored for far too long. 
The pioneering giants of the personal computer have all but vanished after 20 years. Atari, Amiga, Commodore are relics of our recent past, and information stored using such devices is now irretrievable. Each new computer standard allows us to process more information in less time, and growing amounts of data are kept on storage media. With every new digital generation, the data cemetery grows bigger and bigger. In just 20 years, state-of-the-art hardware is obsolete. The once innovative software is no longer available, and old storage devices are left full of inaccessible data. Once opened, they can never be closed again. These tin cans are used for preserving and storing foodstuffs. But what's the link between data storage devices and tin cans? Ravioli, mandarin oranges or haricot vert. When it comes to tin cans, we're more interested in the contents. As for the can itself, for years it was just chuck it away until we reach the recycling age. But who would have thought that by 1938, preserving cans would be helping in the development of ultra-high tech? Konrad Zuse developed the first program-controlled computer ever. But this was no electronic brain with digits and flashing lights, it was purely mechanical. Its computing capacity by today's standards does little more than evoke a smile. The Z1 had a clock frequency of 1 Hz. For comparison, today 3 GHz is normal, that's 3,000 million Hz. But despite that, the Z1 remains a pioneer in computing. Its main memory was 176 bytes and was made from tin cut out of old preserving cans with a fret saw. If today's memory were made from old cans, that would be quite a business. For one gigabyte, you'd need around 3,000 million tin cans. Opened in an instant, quick and easy to prepare. Food from a tin can, the perfect storage medium. Even after five years, foods like tinned ravioli are still fresh and tasty. Nowadays, these practical metal containers are produced on a conveyor belt. One billion cans per year. This kitchen stalwart was invented in France, way back in 1803. We have a Frenchman, Monsieur Aper, to thank for the tin can. Napoleon wanted to ensure that his troops had supplies and needed a means of getting food to them without it going bad. So Monsieur Appert set to work and invented the tin can. Robust, airtight and long-lasting. The key to the tin can's success lies in its raw material. The tin plate is processed by the roll-in can factories. This flexible and stable metal is first cut to shape and then coated. Sheet after sheet goes through the paint bath. The fine coating will later ensure that the food keeps its flavour. The inner coating guarantees that none of the metal can get into the food, spoiling the flavour. The coating, a special paint that's safe for food products, forms a barrier so that no surface particles or tin particles can affect the flavour of the can's contents. Once coated, the tin passes through a hardening furnace. It's heated to over 200 degrees, resulting in a fully hardened coating. And even if the can gets dented, the coating will remain intact and the contents won't be spoiled. Of course you can eat the contents of a dented can. The heating process bonds the paint so firmly to the can body that no metal fragments or debris can contaminate the food inside. The coated tin sheets are then cut into thirds. Each of these metal plates will end up as a tin can. Rolled into a cylinder and then welded, the can body emerges next. The fully automated can production then delivers the finished article. Three million tin cans are produced here every day, and so quickly that it's hard to discern the individual production stages. This is how it looks step by step. The can body is given a special fold at each end, where the lid and bottom will later be fitted. 
Wavy ridges strengthen the thin sides of the can. Now all it needs is a lid. A large punch press cuts out the lids from a long roll of tin plate. The finished lids are dispensed at breakneck speed. Some with tabs, some without. This is a finished lid. It now has a tab and the metal varies in thickness. These ridges which strengthen the lid and it's scored to make it easier to pull open. The finished cans are stacked to the ceiling, awaiting their winter journey to the filling plant. In the industrial scale kitchen of a ravioli manufacturer, the pasta dough is kneaded by the ton, pork is fed through a mincer by the kilo, and many litres of tomato sauce are mixed in. All the ingredients are pre-cooked, then put into the cans, finally passing through a steriliser to conserve the contents. This process works by heat. No preservatives are used. This helps keep the food in the can healthy and tasty. The sterilization or preserving process used by our customers retains the nutrients while killing off any bacteria. Food products from a can are just as healthy as any other, such as fresh or frozen foods. In most cases, food from a can is actually more nutritious than fresh foods. So, if you don't have time to cook, you can always rely on a can for a quick meal. The German research ship Polarstern in the Arctic Ocean. What mineral resources are hidden far down beneath Arctic waters? And what do tin cans have to do with a polar expedition? A man with a vision. The British polar explorer Sir John Franklin set off on the 19th of May 1845 on an expedition to the Arctic Ocean. He wanted to discover the shortest sea route from Europe to Asia using the Northwest Passage. Both his ships were well equipped and had provisions and heating on board to last three years. With a thousand gallons of lemon juice to counter scurvy, many tons of tea, as befits an Englishman, and fresh meat kept in the newly discovered preserving cans. It was this modern storage method that was to seal their fate. The cans were soldered with lead that caused the crew to become increasingly poisoned with every meal. Lead wreaks havoc in the brain, destroying parts of it, leaving a crew that was confused and deranged. Nobody could make a sensible decision. They chose to abandon ship and set up camp on land. Instead of their provisions, heating and weapons for hunting that had been also carefully gathered for the expedition, they took only writing desks and books with them. The Franklin expedition ended in total disaster. The entire crew perished in the icy expanses. 81 degrees north, 135 degrees east. The measuring operations with the streamer are at full speed. The scientists aboard the Paul Ashdown hope the data will provide evidence of mineral resources under the Arctic Sea. The ice is getting thicker. Extreme care is needed to avoid severing the cable on the edge of the ice. Too late. One of the boys has torn off. To be on the safe side, they haul in the mile-long measuring cable. The golden rule on the bridge is that the Polarstern must take the safest route through the ice. That means avoiding the ice flows and steering around thick pack ice. The Arctic Ocean is highly coveted. Many countries are staking claims on parts of this region. They all hope to find new, unexploited sources of raw materials in the Arctic. The ice is getting thicker. It has to be kept away from the ship, otherwise the measuring equipment can't be lowered into the water or pulled out again. The scientists struggle to retrieve their ground sample. 
This Kastenlot Cora has enabled them to bring aboard deposits from 6,500 feet deep. They hope the mud will provide information on the formation of the Arctic Ocean. This ocean was once an inland sea, separated from the Atlantic. During the interglacial period, the sea level rose and the mainland was submerged. The forests were flooded too, and over millions of years they became oil, gas and coal deposits under the seabed. Back on board, the scientists carefully open up the Kastenlort core. It's important not to damage the layers on the inside. Colorations in the sediment indicate changes between glacial and interglacial periods and reveal the makeup of the soil. This sample doesn't tell the researchers very much. They find no evidence of fossil fuels like oil or gas. Only by boring deeper can they hope to find clear indications of mineral resources. But the Polar Stern faces the usual problem when boring in the Arctic. The ship seems to have come to a standstill. Though in reality, it's imperceptibly drifting along with the ice at several yards per minute. In the meantime, the Polar Stern has reached her most northerly position, 600 nautical miles from the North Pole. The researchers intend to measure the drift of sea ice. Polar bear tracks are visible from the helicopter. They'll have to be on their guard because the scientists are looking for a suitable site to install their measuring equipment. Under six feet of ice lies the Arctic Ocean. During their stop on this huge ice flow, the ice drift carries the polar researchers several hundred yards away. The scientists put a probe in place. It will remain under the ice to measure the motion of the drift. It's fitted with a regular prepaid cell phone card, which allows it to transmit data to the mainland via satellite for up to two years. Similar data buoys provide information on salinity levels, density and temperature. Data which is available immediately via satellite and which constantly documents climatic change. If global warming continues, the polar ice will melt even more, allowing companies unrestricted access to the raw materials in the Arctic. But right now, it's still not decided who actually owns the Arctic seabed.